Let's take our Bibles and turn to these verses that Terry read for us out of Second Peter chapter 2. And I just want to, to think for a few minutes. You know, it's the, uh, not only Peter, but so many of these other, other uh, apostles and, and were warning all the time about false teachers and false people coming in and creeping in and trying to, to uh, destroy their, their walk with the Lord and their faith. Do you ever see that around here any place? Well, we sure do, don't we? You know, that, that false teachers are trying their best. Satan is using them to, to try to disrupt our walk with the Lord. And so we need to be strong, don't we? We need to look to the Lord every day and just for his guidance and direction and, and help. It's not easy. Uh, we used to sing that song years ago. It's not an easy road we're traveling together. And it's not, is it? For a Christian, it's difficult uh, to, to live a Christian life. And, but with God's help, it's not impossible. Last week, we looked at false prophets and teachers that were condemned. And just because of the things they were doing, how God obviously uh, condemns these people. And they condemn themselves, don't they, really? Uh, by not doing what God wants him today. So today I want to look at some more why they were condemned. And there's reasons for that. You know, God doesn't condemn a person just for, for, for doing what's right. He condemns him for doing what's wrong. When you do something that's wrong, that's what God is, is, con is uh, condemns a person for. Not for doing right, but for doing wrong. So what were these people doing? That was so wrong that God condemned them. You know, if you, I would assume, just like the people that we have in our community today that go around from door to door or wherever, uh, good people, if you just looked at their, their lifestyle, in most cases you would find that they were, that they're good people. And that's, that's what it was back there, I believe, as well, too. That these false teachers were good people. In fact, if I understand correctly, they were sitting in, in, their, in their churches, as we would relate to that today, uh, just like the rest of us. And yet they were, they were seeking to destroy God's work. And as a result of that, they're going to come under uh, strong condemnation, teaching, false doctrine, and uh, just, again, hindering the work. So let's just look at some of the reasons for God's severe judgment. This week and continue with this same thought next week. First, first of all, false teachers doomed in verses 12 and 13, the first part of that verse from Second Peter chapter 2 says, But these like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of an unrighteous, of unrighteousness as those who count pleasure to carouse in the, in the daytime. Peter said that they were speaking evil of things that they didn't even, even understand. You know, it's kind of interesting that sometimes people say things that they don't even know what they're talking about, and yet they still say things that they should. And I think this is high on, on uh, God's list of Fools are people who's, who uh, talk like this and, and uh, are going to be judged for that. Sometimes, you know, it's better just to keep your mouth shut if you don't know what you're talking about, isn't it? And yet uh, some people have trouble doing that. And, uh, you know, I liken this to a person who claims to be an evolutionist or an atheist. And we sure have a lot of them uh, in our world today. As you watch television, I've watched a few debates with... Uh, Richard Dawkins and, and Christopher Hitchens and some of these different people who, who are claimed to be evolution, or evolution and atheists both, and they say there is no God. You know, it's pretty sad when they when they come to that conclusion, and not only for themselves but for others who, uh, you know, they try to seek to lead astray. You know, in Peter's day, uh, Peter talked about people in Peter's day talked as if they knew what they were talking about. But it was the opposite of what God was saying. You know, we've heard the, the phrase, you know, blah, 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 blah. They just talk and, and uh, again, don't know what's, what's going on. And 
their eyes, their lips were moving, and their their uh, lips were flapping, but flapping with destructive talk. And these are the ones that Peter are condemned. So, what was some of their problems? They were teaching false doctrine and coming in and seeking to destroy the work within the church. <clears throat> The sad part of it is are there are those who believe what they hear from these different people. You know, it's my understanding that the cults are getting many of their people out of the churches rather than, you know, people who claim to not know anything about the Lord or, or are walking with him at least. They're getting people who are a little disgruntled with what they hear in, in churches and are, are, they're drawing these people out and, and with their deceptiveness they attract these people into their own beliefs. People who talk something that they don't even know about or just, just idle type talk, you know. I think that uh, we have some of these, obviously we have these people. You know, could that be said of politicians? This is past, past uh, you know, Prior up to now, we've had these, now that the election is over, we're probably not, well, I don't know, we're going to have people still raising a lot of, a lot of uh, statements. But anyway, I don't want to get off on the, on the politics part. But, you know, just saying things and doing things that are not pleasing to God. And that's what God is, is trying to, and Peter here is trying to share that God's going to judge these people. Was uh, says be sure be be sure your sins will find you out. It's really true, isn't it? You know you can you might think you're getting away with something, but in reality, uh, you're not getting away with it at all. And God knows our hearts. He knows what we say. <clears throat> and Peter says it's like they're like brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed. He considered them to be uh, having sunk lower even than uh, an ordinary person. They're doing things that they, they uh, that were evil in God's sight. Peter said that they will perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness. See, you don't mess with God and get away with it. You might think you are, but you're not going to get away with it, and God's going to bring judgment down on those who attempt to do that. You know, it doesn't sound like a very happy ending to me. I don't know about you, but to have God's wrath poured out on you sounds like a pretty pretty sad situation and a difficult position to be in. And I, I trust it. That would not be the case of any of us here. But it's, it's, some, it's one thing to talk about something one doesn't really understand, but to deliberately talk about something that isn't true is a different story. And so we need to guard what we say, don't we? Was it... Uh, uh, seemed like it was in Isaiah where he said, put a, put a guard about my mouth and, and keep me from saying things that I shouldn't be saying and saying the things that I should say. So false teachers are going to be doomed according to these verses. And what are some of their sins in verses 13, the last part of that verse through verse 19? Uh, it says, they are spots and blemishes, carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity, a dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds without, uh, clouds without carried about by a tempest, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. For when they speak evil, or when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the, uh, through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in the, in the air. While they, while they promise in liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought, brought into bondage. And he goes on to talk more about that in uh, 
the rest of the chapter. But again, it's just basically a warning and a warning and a warning and a warning to look out for these people because they're going to cause problems within the group, within the church. And again, like I said, they're just, they were sitting here just like us and teaching false doctrines. He says that they'll be paid for what they do. Doesn't the Bible say the wages of sin is not life, but the wages of sin is death, isn't it? And that's what God's, God's going to pour out his judgment, his wrath on these people. God's word says that we reap what we sow. They were carousers back in verse 13, the last part of it. What's a carouser? I don't know if you ever thought of that. And I don't remember what your, your uh, version said there for that. Verse 13, the last part. Okay, so it still uses the same word there then, carousing. Uh, but what is a carouser? It's someone, as I understand, someone who's living an immoral lifestyle. And that appeared to be what these people were doing here. They were living immoral lifestyles. John MacArthur said, sinning during the day without the cover of darkness was a sign of low-level wickedness in Roman society. Didn't matter when they sinned. You know, it used to be that the Bible said that the uh, People would sin, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Seems like today they don't mind sinning any time, daytime, nighttime, doesn't make any difference when, but, uh, you know, just <clears throat> being caught up in that sin. And even though they were tempted to cover their corruption with religious talk, they were filthy defects on the church gatherings. Again, sitting in church, looking like a normal person, well, as opposed to what? Abnormal? Anyhow, they sat there and, and they, you know, they, you couldn't tell the difference is what I'm trying to say. You couldn't tell the difference between them or other Christians until you heard them talk. And then, of course, you could tell the difference when that happened. But these ungodly false teachers were a danger, were dangerous and corrupting presence in the body of Christ, destroying the body from within. Wasn't it uh, Khrushchev? who said, you know, that the United States would fall because of corruption within. But we sure see that happening, don't we? This, the downfall of our country, not from outside, but from what's going on inside. And what a horrible thing that is, it, corruption from within. They not only deceived themselves, but they deceived others as well, too. They preyed on the unstable to join them in their wicked, ungodly ways. They were coveters. Verse 14, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, they have a heart trained in covetousness, uh, covetous practices, and are cursed children. Coveters. What's a coveter? Someone who wants something that doesn't belong to them, right? You know, if somebody who, who sees something and wants something. Someone who wants that which doesn't belong to him or her. Among those that Peter was writing to, this letter to, uh, it was someone who was allowing his unbridled passions to consume him. Apparently, according to scripture, these, these people that were doing that were so corrupt in their moral lifestyle that uh, they couldn't look at a woman without seeing her as a potential adulteress. That's pretty sad, isn't it? to live that kind of a lifestyle. But the false teachers had trained their minds to concentrate on nothing but the forbidden things for which their passions lusted. They were coveters. They were rejectors, verses 15 and 16. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of righteousness, unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice uh, restrained the madness of the prophet. They were rejectors. Again, MacArthur says the right way is an Old Testament metaphor uh, for obedience to God. And that's what he says here. They, they longed to do what they thought. Uh, they were rebuked for doing this, this living this kind of a lifestyle. Imagine a donkey talking to you. That would get your attention, wouldn't it? You know, here God used uh, Balaam's donkey to get his attention because Balaam wasn't listening to God. 
God was trying to to get hold of him, and he wasn't listening, and so he used a donkey, and uh, to to speak to him. What a what a interesting, sad situation that. Well, you can find that story in Numbers chapter 22 through chapter 24 if you want to look that story up and read about it. It's it's a rather interesting story. He preferred he preferred wealth and popularity over faithfulness and obedience to God. They were wells, verse 17. These are wells without water. What good is a well without water, Ruby? Well, Ruby's not in here right now. But, uh, you know, you can, you can imagine, what, would, what good would a well do if there's no water in it? Useless, isn't it? You know, there's no, no, uh, no need for a well that doesn't have any water in it. Wells that look deep and have promise, but no water in them. Imagine going to a well on a hot day, and you're looking for, you know, a, a cool drink, and you get to the well, and it's it's empty. There's no water in it. What a disappointment that would be. At least I believe it would be quite disappointing to think, ah, at last, I can get some water, and then find out that... Uh, there's no water in that well. That's what he was referring to. These pe useless people is basically what he's saying when he was saying they were wells without water. These ungodly false teachers were as empty as that kind of well. Listen to what Jude has to say uh, about this type of person over in Jude. If you want to turn over there with me, it's just a couple, just a couple books away after you pass First, Second, Third John. In Jude, and there's no chapters there, but verses 12 and 13 says, talking about this same type of person, says, These are spots in your love feast while they feast with you. They were in the group while they feast with you uh, without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carrying about by the winds, carried about by the winds, laid on in trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their, their own uh, shame. Wandering stars, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Can you imagine that? The blackness of darkness forever. Useless. They were just, uh, just as useless as, a, as a, uh, a well that didn't have any water in it, or dry as uh, they had a form of godliness, but they were denying the power thereof, as the Bible tells us, and they, and they looked good. They looked like what we would term today a Christian. <clears throat> but in reality, they were clean on the outside, but dirty on the inside. And that's not the kind of person God's looking for, is he? He's not looking for a person who, who looks good on the outside, but is corrupt and dirty on the inside. Peter says that this type of person is reserved for the blackness of darkness forever. Does that sound like a long time for you, to you? Sure does to me, doesn't it? A reserved for the blackness and darkness forever. You know, some people say, well, when I go to hell, I'll be with all my friends and enjoying myself and, and just having a good old time. But it's my understanding, according to Scripture, that hell is going to be as black as black as can be, and even if you were standing right next to somebody, you would never be able to see them. It would be just like if you were absolutely, totally blind. <clears throat> they were empty clouds, like clouds that bring only darkness and no nourishing rain. We're used to seeing clouds, and you know, if you go out this morning and look around out there, you see it's cloudy, but there's no rain. And boy, you know, we could have sure used some of that this winter, this summer, couldn't we? When it, it was so hot and dry here, and we could have used some rain, we didn't get any. And clouds might come up and, and uh, you know, and then disappear. He's saying that's what these kinds of people were like. They were like clouds that are driven about, but no rain in them. You know, we might refer to these clouds as useless. And so it is with a person who looks like a Christian but doesn't act like when one. These men were full of deceitfulness and unrighteousness. 
the type of person that Peter says is reserved for the blackness and dark of darkness forever. And again, that's a long time. Verses 18 and 19, they were promise makers. Verses 18 and 19 say, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure uh, through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome by him, who uh, also he is brought into bondage. Make great promises, but their promises are empty, aren't they? And he says, I thought this was in escaped, uh, back in verse 19 again, it says, through Lumis, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. So these people were ones that were in bondage, if you want to say, and then escaped from that, talking about the, let's say, the, the person within the church, escaped from that. And now these false teachers are trying to bring them back in again to put them back into bondage again, even though they themselves were in, in bondage. Isn't that what it says there? Uh, for while they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. The New American Standard Bible reads that this way. It says, For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who barely escape from the ones who live in order, live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. And so they were they were caught up in the snares themselves. Uh, it goes in Galatians chapter uh, 5, I think it's verse 1, it says, Don't be entangled again with the, the things that trip you up and cause problems in your in your walk with the Lord. And this is what these people, so he's warning them, you know, don't, don't get caught in that snare. Don't get caught in that trap. Uh, from these people who are trying to to draw you back in to the ways of, that you used to be in, but are no longer in there. <clears throat> While they promised those who follow them with liberty or freedom, again, they themselves were in bondage. You know, as a person living in the flesh, you're going to be in bondage, are you? If we... If we live in within the flesh and for fleshly desires we're going to be in bondage so where can freedom be found there's only one place where we can find freedom and that's in god and our relationship with him you know you're not going to find freedom in the world you're not going to find freedom in things like satan uh, satan would promise you know oh, do these things and man you'll be free you'll have all kinds of fun do what you want but there's always a consequence to living that kind of a lifestyle when we seek freedom in the wrong way, we become slaves of corruption. And what a, what a sad situation that is. So, it's sad when some have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are getting tangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the, than the beginning, according to what God's Word says. You know what it says here in verse 19? <clears throat> verse 18 and 19, okay, those who live in corruption escape those who live in error while they be promised liberty, uh, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. Anyway, uh, verse 20 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them, and overcome the latter end is worse uh, for them than the beginning. Uh, verse 20, and we'll look more at that next week. <laughs> but God has a special place reserved for those that live this kind of a lifestyle and uh, cause this kind of problems. That place is called what? The Bible tells us it's called hell, isn't it? And hell was made only for Satan, and it was designed for Satan, but the Bible also tells us there's going to be an awful lot of people that are going to be spending eternity there in hell simply because they won't accept the work that Jesus Christ did for them there on the cross. 
after you read a little bit about what hell is going to be like, I don't want to spend my eternity there. I don't think you do either. And we don't have to. That's the neat part of it. We don't have to spend eternity in hell. And it's so simple. So how do we escape spending eternity in hell? First of all, we have to recognize we're sinners, don't we? And after we recognize the fact that we're sinners, then we can we repent of that sin and then ask the Lord to come into our life and, and to be our Savior, our King, our Lord, and live that kind of lifestyle. Does that make me perfect after that? No, not by a long ways. I'm not perfect, are you? No, we're certainly not, are we? And so we're not looking for perfection, even though the Bible tells us, be holy as I am holy, God said, and uh, be perfect as he's perfect. God expects that. But being humans, uh, we're not going to live without some sin in some way in our lives. But I'm thankful there's forgiveness, and this is part of it too, isn't it? Uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to spend eternity in hell, and we don't have to if we trust the work that Jesus Christ did for us on the, on the cross. I've done that. Have you done that? Have you trusted Jesus Christ and the work that he did for us on the cross? That's our only hope, isn't it? Without that, we have no hope. And if we have no hope, the Bible tells us, if we have no hope on this in this life, we're all men most miserable. You know, what a sad, sad situation to not have any hope. Uh, Chuck Swindoll one time said, you can live so long without food, you can live so long without water, but you can't live without hope. Why do you think so many people take their own lives? Because they're so happy with what's going on around them, and they're, they have all everything they want, and all their needs are met. They don't have hope. They don't have hope, and that's why they end up taking their lives. In many cases, uh, I'm glad that I have hope, and I'm, I, uh, I hope you have hope. How's that? Uh, because that's what it's all about, isn't it? We need that hope, and that hope only comes from the Lord. And the only way we can get that is, again, by putting our faith and trust in him. So if you don't have hope, you can get it. It's so simple that even a child can do it. Even a child can become a Christian simply by trusting. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know everything there is to know about God and spiritual matters, <clears throat> but just simply by trusting in what he did for us on the cross gives us that hope. So I trust that you have that hope this morning, <clears throat> and you're looking forward. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's one thing uh, I was so appreciative of Virginia's brother that just passed away. You know, that uh, <clears throat> he had that hope. You know, he says, God has me right where he wants me, and I know where I'm going when I die. That's a hope that he had, and I don't know where he's at today. He's certainly not in this outer darkness, but he's absent from the body, is present with the Lord, and I believe without any doubt whatsoever that that's where he is today, simply because after living a, a long life of, of uh, sin, turning around and, and being forgiven of that sin, and it doesn't matter what you've done. You know, it doesn't matter if you've committed the worst sin or, or the least sin. God still is willing to forgive. How do I know that? Look at the Apostle Paul. Remember what he said? I'm the chiefest of sinners. That's what he considered himself. And if you look at some of the things that he did, uh, you see why he could say that. And yet, did God save him? Did God use him? Sure did, didn't he? And uh, so we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot of hope. I pray that we, we exercise that hope and, and look to God for our our daily walk. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the hope that you've given to us only through the work that your son did for us there on the cross. If we hadn't, if he hadn't done that, we would be hopeless and helpless and hell-bound to spend eternity apart from you. But I thank you that you've given us hope in that work. And we have so much to look forward to. <clears throat> and again, to be absent from this body is to be present with you. No long waiting period or anything else, but it's instantaneous. So encourage us today and help us to put off the old man, the sin nature, and put on the new, like Corinthians, Second Corinthians says, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So help us to live that kind of a lifestyle 
instead of one that uh, doesn't have hope and is only headed for destruction. We have a lot to be thankful for, and we thank you that you've given us these illustrations of people who didn't have that relationship with you and what happens to them to help us prevent help prevent us from going the same direction that they did. So thank you for these things. We pray in your name. Amen.